thanks for meeting me, Max. Um, clearly, there's a massive problem. Yeah. Why isn't the government doing anything about it? Because banks and property developers make massive profits off this housing system at the moment. I know you mentioned before that the top 1% own 25% of investment properties in Australia. The big banks are just recording massive half yearly profits, like going up by 10 or 20%, uh, billions and billions of dollars. This housing system might screw over the vast majority of people. For the people that hold power in this country, you know, the big banks that donate millions of dollars to the major parties, to the property developers that now sit on some government boards, uh, and for those top 1% who end up donating a lot of money to the major parties, well, it works for them. So really, the major parties don't really want to change that. With the political donations, I mean, you know, Albo talks a lot about how he, was, he came from public housing. The political donations are so, like, powerful that he can forget his upbringing. Like, is that, is that what's happening here? Yeah, I mean, it's the political donations. It's also the revolving door. So, uh, on the one hand, the government's just set up this, wants to set up this thing called the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council. Big name, but basically it's the body they want to advise them on tackling the housing crisis. Guess who they want to put the head of that? The outgoing CEO of major property developer, Mervac. Uh, which, look, it's sort of inviting the fox to be in charge of protecting the hen house. Uh, and then Anna Bly, former Labor Premier of Queensland, well, she's the head of the banks. Now, you've basically just got this revolving door of personnel between the big property developers and banks and the major parties telling each other how to set up a housing system that continues to make them lots of money. So yeah, I mean, uh, you could have Mother Teresa at the head of the Labor Party and you'd probably still end up having a really broken housing system. So the issue is like clearly so much deeper than just housing affordability. Mm. Um, but for a lot of young people, it feels like we're very powerless in this, this discussion. Mm. What can we actually do? How do we change things? That powerlessness and that feeling of it is crucial to maintaining the current system. Like one of the things you'll notice politicians do all the time is tell you there's not much you can do about it, we're doing everything we can. And what they're trying to do is set the terms of debate to such a narrow extent that you lose all hope. So the first thing to know is things, as you pointed out before in your videos, have been a lot better previously. And uh, certainly we proved in Griffith where we knocked on hundreds of thousands of doors and went and chatted to people and said, you know what, it doesn't have to be like this. Uh, we can have a system that builds lots of public and affordable housing, uh, phases out capital gains tax and negative gearing, caps rent increases, and we can run on that platform and we can win if we go and reach people and capture them at their homes and chat to them and get them to recognise that you're not alone. And I'm sure a lot of people watching this are sitting here thinking, I'm copying a massive rent increase, I'm never going to own a home, but what am I going to do about it? Well, part of it is getting active and recognising that just because... Uh, sort of those power holders in society, those politicians who run the country, might tell you that there's nothing that can change. That's wish fulfilment for them. What they're actually saying is we hope you keep thinking that. Yeah. Uh, but we know in history the only time we've ever changed things is when people get together, get organised collectively and wield power as a collective, as a large group of people and demand things of power because it sure as hell isn't going to happen, unfortunately, with a few posts on Twitter or Facebook, but it will happen if people start to feel like they're part of a much bigger movement. And we proved that in Griffith, uh, and I'm sure that's just a micro level, but we can prove it across the country as well. Tangential question here, but uh, something that I was thinking about the other day was that just before the COVID lockdowns, mm. we had a couple of really big climate strikes. Yeah. A few pe people were really activated on multiple generations. Mm. How do you think <laughs> that's played into our ability now to like get out on the streets. There's been, I have only been to one protest since, the, since lockdown. Um, yeah, it's a great question. There was this big sense of demobilization um, during the pandemic and we all had to be locked down in our homes. And it was telling actually that what the impact of that afterwards in terms of no longer having those social connections and uh, the impact that had, I mean, I think the other thing to say is the sort of organising we need to win. Part of it is big rallies in the street. That's really important. Uh, but it's only part of the picture because obviously we had those massive climate strikes and we still haven't forced the government to stop spending all that money on opening up new coal and gas. Part of it is that longer form organising as well. To give you an example, uh, Vienna uh, is a, uh, 
amazing city, partly because uh, rents are capped, 60% of housing there is some form of social housing. Uh, doctors, teachers, nurses live in that housing. Uh, it's basically a renter's utopia. Now, they won that the hard way. So in the early 20th century, they did have those big marches, massive renter's rights strikes, big marches on the city. But they also organised via, back then, what was called the um, Austrian Social Democrats. And they organised uh, over many years, lots of door knocking, lots of party organising, as well as those big rallies. And they fundamentally transformed uh, the city of Vienna and its housing system. And it's had an impact today. There is still public housing there right now, built in that period as a result of that activism that houses people. Uh, at an enormous scale. I went and visited it actually in 2019 because I'm a massive housing nerd. Uh, and it was very cool to see. And so the legacies, the sort of bricks and mortar legacy of that people power and action, uh, and it is proof that things can change, but also proof that the only way things are going to change is with long form and uh, really serious and committed uh, political organising. It's interesting because we show up for our footy teams and our cricket teams and yeah. stuff in great numbers but for some reason we can't do it for ourselves. Yes. Uh, and that's a really interesting disconnection there, that we're not going to fight, we don't fight for ourselves in the same way we do for the Swannies yeah. or the Maroons in your case, yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, it, well, it's a great point. And, you know, I loved your videos, by the way. And, and one of the stories you tell is uh, neo, the arrival of neoliberalism in Australia in the 1990s. Now, something really massive happened in the 1990s. Uh, back then... Uh, one in two people were a member of a trade union. Uh, you know, you walking down the street, every second person, every worker you see, you know is a member of their trade union. Now, unfortunately, as much as a lot of people like Hawkey and Keating, one of the things they did is they helped organise basically the massive demobilisation of the Australian labour movement. Now, these days, less than 14% of people are members of their trade unions. Uh, and actually, you have a lot of trade unions that often uh, don't sort of demand the same things that they used to uh, in the 20th century, uh, often because there's a lot of unfortunate links between the trade union movement and the Labor Party. And so a lot of people just, you know, they might have an experience of going to support the local footy team, but how many people these days have the experience of feeling real collective strength? Like, I don't know, like I've, I've worked in political activism, work for trade unions, and I can count on one hand the times I've experienced that, where you look at your fellow worker, wherever workplace you're at, you know, at the pub, working in retail, working in the public service, wherever you are, and thinking, you know what, I'm experiencing real collective strength right now. Uh, and so that, a lot of people don't have that experience, and, and your experience of politics is something you watch on TV, or something you watch on TikTok, yeah. or, some, or some headline you read, or maybe you're chatting with your mates down at the pub, uh, but it's an individual experience and you think, oh, this sucks, but I have no idea what to do about it. And so one of the things we've been chipping away on, uh, the organising we were doing in Queensland, uh, was over time giving people the experience of what it's like to wield collective strength. And for us in Griffith, winning the, uh, one of the three for, you know, federal lower house seats the Greens have ever won, on a, on a really progressive platform of basically doing what the governments used to do on housing uh, was, oh, this is what happens when thousands of people go and knock on doors, chat to their neighbours and talk to them about politics in a way that actually speaks to their material lives. And it changes things and you win. And my God, winning feels pretty good, actually. Yeah. Uh, and we haven't done enough of that lately. And um, when you win, you realise, well, that was my contribution to that. That was my 20 doors that I knocked on or a thousand doors I knocked on. Uh, and we just need more of that now. Progress actually takes, you know, little incremental changes to get to where we need to go. Like, we can't be progressive without actually trying to progress. That's it. And, being, and I think you're getting to the key point, patience. I think there's this expectation. You look back in history and you're like, oh, they won all this stuff. And I went to that one rally and the world didn't change. And uh, you're right, you didn't. But then if you look at the scope, the, the rate of change, even though I mentioned... Vienna before, it takes decades of slow, hard organising work. And every year you might recruit an extra 20 or 30 people. Every year you might win one or extra two federal, state, local seats. Every year you might get one that light, tiny little bit of a thousand extra people that you've trained up to go and organise a rally or knock on doors. Um, but that adds up. That adds up. And uh, the only way we're going to change this sort of system, the system that, by the way, uh, 
they took decades to create as well. Those property developers, those banks, those politicians. It's taken them from the 1990s to now to create the system that works perfectly for them. And it's gonna take a similar amount of time for us to chip back the other way. And that sucks, to be honest, because a lot of us right now are hurting. Uh, but if we're serious about getting change, then it means getting our heads down and realizing the people that we're fighting uh, are not gonna fuck around. And they have an enormous amount of wealth and power and pushing back on that is gonna take time. Wow. Um, how do we actually fix this housing crisis? Well, one of the things you've pointed out already is a mass build of public and affordable housing. As you said, if we were building the same rate as we were building today, uh, back in the 20th century, you'd build 150,000 public and affordable homes over the next five years. And that's not just how, you, th you hear public housing, right? And you know what you hear? You hear the most vulnerable, downtrodden people. You know what, how the government used to build homes for teachers, nurses, workers, university professors. And right now, there are people in Vienna or in a lot of places in Europe who might be earning a pretty good income, but they live in a good public home. And then they pay a subsidized rent, so maybe 25% of their income capped. But because they're on a good income, that goes back into the system to help build new public and affordable housing. I mean, either your rent or mortgage payments go to a bank or it goes back to the public coffers to go and build new good and affordable housing. The second thing we need to do is stop spending billions of dollars a year on tax concessions for property investors. So negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions need to go. Now, uh, in practical terms, what that means, negative gearing, is uh, a property investor can have 20 investment properties and in any other world where they're making a loss on that, say, like they're not making enough to maintain it, then maybe they sell it to a first home buyer. But with negative gearing, first things first, they're making a big enough loss, they can actually write that off on their tax. So they can reduce their taxable income, basically, by collectively billions of dollars. And then the capital gains tax discount, you know how you pay tax at the end of the year and the income? Maybe you're making 20, 30, $40,000 tax? Well, guess what? If you're a property investor, you get a 50% discount on that. So if you, you might be a minimum wage worker uh, and you end up, or you might be earning 50, 60, $70,000 a year, you don't get a 50% discount on your tax, but a property investor does. Now here's this. And they get rent. That's it, and they get rent. So capital gains and negative gearing are gonna cost, yeah, that's right, Fed, the federal budget this year, uh, about $12 billion just going to property investors. That's crazy, right? They're spending $12 billion subsidizing property investors. And, whereas they should be spending that $12 billion building public and affordable housing. Now, the final thing we need to do is cap or freeze rent increases. Now, people go around being like, oh, that's a crazy radical policy. Australia did it during the pandemic. So five states and territories, places like Victoria, introduced an emergency freeze on rent increases. Uh, I would argue the housing emergency is much worse now. Post-World War II in Australia and during World War II in Australia, the federal government froze rent increases and then they capped rent increases after that. In Spain right now, they've said in areas of high rental growth, rents are only allowed to go up now by 3% every year. And what that means for that renter is you don't cop that one or $200 a week rent increase, but it means you're spending less of your income on rent so you can save up to buy a house or save up to do that thing that you wanna do, whether to go on holiday or, or you know, honestly, just to have enough money to pay food, pay for food or, or feed your kids at the end of the week. It is, like, you hear a lot of this talk, right, of how radical that might sound, but just invert it for a second. The housing's one of the things you need, right, like health and education, uh, that you need to live a good life. It is insane that basically we have a housing system where one third of the country who rents, at the end of their lease, usually about a year, they're subject to unlimited rent increases. Unlimited. As much as the landlord wants. That doesn't actually make any sense for providing an essential service and by the way, the ACT does have a pretty mild form of rent cap. So it's also happening in Australia as well at the moment. The way that I think about that is looking at the American health system. Yeah. And we look at that and go, wow, that's crazy that you, you break your leg, it's going to send your brain corrupt. Yes. But that's the same system we have for housing. Like, yeah. you know, if, if we only had 2% public hospitals in the country, then private health would be really expensive. Yes. But we've just accepted that for housing. Yes. And that's just a crazy, crazy concept, but it's that we get used to the scenario that we live in yes. too easily. It's like a frog in slow boiling water. And, you know, these three key things is supported that happened in the 1990s, where all of a sudden, most unfortunately, a lot of Labor governments just had massive cuts on the amount of funding that went towards building public and affordable housing. 
and you had property prices start to take off as capital gains tax concessions uh, were introduced and uh, they completely deregulated the banks uh, and finance markets so they could go crazy on um, giving up mortgages to property investors. And all of that happened, right? But it happened slowly. The change happened slowly. And you're right. All of a sudden, a lot of new generations wake up and like, hang on, I'm being completely screwed. And it's all of ideology works in a funny way. But as you said, it's made to feel natural. But like we, as you said, we laugh at the US, we want to laugh, we look in horror at the US health system. But the same thing's happening here for housing, as you said. And by the way, imagine if only hot emergency wards were private. You better believe there would be an Airbnb for emergency wards right now. That, you know, you better believe that you would basically be like, go to go to an emergency ward. And if it was only private, they'd be like, sorry, we've jacked up the cost of your emergency ward admission by $1,000. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. But we have that system for housing. And it makes absolutely no sense. And the politicians in charge at the moment just like to pretend that we can't do anything else. A lot of people might say that, you know, oh, we're lefty greenies. We just want everyone to have their lollipops and rainbows. Yeah. It doesn't even seem like the system is working well on a capitalistic sense. It's not even working for most businesses. You know, one of the key issues that businesses talk about uh, in terms of getting skilled workers is that a lot of the time the skilled workers can't afford to live anywhere near where those businesses need workers because rents are going up too fast and houses are too expensive. The other crazy thing is we have a really unproductive economy. So back in the 1990s and 1980s, only about 20% of bank lending went to housing. Now, because housing became this really lucrative thing that banks could make billions and billions of dollars off, writing really cheap long-term mortgages and then jacking up the interest rates, over 60% of lending in Australia from banks goes to housing. Now, get this, that's the most in the OECD. That's more than the United States, that's more than Britain, that's more than any of those countries we laugh at. Australian banks make more money and lend more to housing than any other banking system in the OECD. Like, that's mad. Um, and imagine if uh, those regional towns that right now that can't find enough uh, teachers or nurses or aged care workers, or those parts of town... Uh, I, you know, I've visited uh, childcare centres who say our biggest problem is no one, none of the childcare workers can afford to live anywhere near uh, where uh, we want them to work. Imagine if they could move into a good, nice home where they could start a family and they're only spending 25% uh, of their income on rent. Imagine those small businesses that get that a little extra help along the way. Imagine that pub where someone can go buy that extra pint of beer. Imagine that tourism economy where someone can go actually afford to go on one holiday a year. Uh, imagine that little extra savings so they can save up to pay for that crucial little bit of extra um, health emergency or, or you know, going and getting a retraining and going and studying something new so they can go and retrain and help the economy change. Uh, all of that stuff, we're being held back because the biggest beneficiaries of the housing system, basically hoarding homes and cash, are the banks, property developers and that top 1% who own 25% of investment properties. And they're just hoarding cash when we could be putting it to work on health and education and new jobs and manufacturing and helping those small businesses thrive and most importantly, giving everyone an affordable home. That, that capital could be going to businesses to innovate, to come up with better solar or yeah. better, better cures for things. And, you know, it's yeah. just crazy that it's just all held up in an asset that doesn't do anything for anyone except for the two people that live in there. Yeah, that's right. And even for them, it doesn't really work, right? Like you, you talk about, it's, it's the wealth they can't use. If you're a homeowner, you own one home, you don't plan to move out of it. Maybe you want to give it to your kids um, and its value keeps going up. The only people that's worth really any money to is the banks. Like you, you're not going to, like you're not, you can't, someone's like, oh, your house is worth a million dollars. You're not going to go sell it and then just spend the million dollars because you still need a home. And so we're just locking up all of this wealth in the economy, uh, as you said. Like, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars. Imagine if 60% of bank lending went to productive business and manufacturing and, and renewable energy instead of to housing. Imagine how different our economy might look. Say the housing market crashes. Yeah. Like, you know, we go worst case scenario, maybe best case scenario for, in, for some of us. Yes. The housing market crashes. My parents' house goes from being worth $3 million to yeah. being worth $1 million, but so does the house next door to them. Mm. If they want to move mm. to, a, to a house that's exactly the same as theirs, it's still costing the same. They're just trading one thing that is worth this to another thing. Yeah. This is... Uh, one thing on this is... This is why right now the banks have set it up so tails they win and heads you lose. Because the one thing that will happen if the housing market collapses uh, is 
uh, a lot of people will end up owing more money on their house than it's worth. And at that point, it's called negative equity, uh, really bad. Because what happens in other, we saw in Europe or in the US when the housing market crashed is big, massive finance firms like BlackRock, by the way, if you're at home watching right now, look up BlackRock and, then, uh, and how much money they manage. It's, they, they manage more money than the Australian economy is worth. Uh, and they just went and bought up a lot of houses and it destroyed people's lives. Now, this is what happens when you tie everyone into a financial system that only really works, I sound repetitive here, but for the banks. Now, if the housing market collapses, by the way, what Obama should have done post the GFC, which he didn't, and arguably created the social conditions for Trump, uh, and what should happen in Australia if that happens, is the government should step in uh, and uh, relieve people, first home buyers mortgage debt, uh, and make sure they get to stay in their home. And for those property investors that end up having to sell, those homes should be bought, and given to either first home buyers or turned into good affordable public housing. Uh, and whereas what we've seen in the past is where housing markets collapsed, is the first, you know, the first people the government bails out? It's the banks. <laughs> it's the banks. Yeah. It's the banks. And why is it every time there's a financial crisis, why is it every time uh, the economy collapses, the first piece of governments go and look after are the people screwing us over in the first place? Yeah. Why is it that Obama went and bailed out the banks? Why is it in Europe that uh, the first thing they cared about uh, was the profitability of uh, those big financial execs, uh, who then, by the way, got massive bonuses the year after they were bailed out? Why weren't the first? Why weren't the mortgage holders bailed out? Why weren't the renters bailed out? And I think that you just look at those moments and you think this is what we need to organise towards. By the way. Because if that housing crisis comes, we need to be ready to make sure that we demand of our governments that the people get bailed out and not the big corporations. How do we build these houses without cutting down trees and taking up more of our precious land? Well, I just looked at other places around the world that have nailed it. So City of Vienna is a great example. 60% uh, of that city is obviously some form of social housing, but it means the housing's not built for profit, it's built for people. So they have good medium density, mostly about five storeys. And as a result, they have a population density much higher than any city in Australia. But, you know, they have rooftop gardens at the top, childcare centres embedded in the bottom, good provision of public park land and public infrastructure, and the housing is affordable. Now, we can build cities like that, but first things first, we need to stop building cities that prioritise the profit of property developers and start building cities that put people first. And that might sound radical, but then it's done around the world. There's no reason why we can't do it here. Cool. All right. That's good. Sick. Thanks so much. Thank you.